Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Before we start, I want to remind everyone that we will have Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please use the live Q&A tool in the portal to ask your questions. This session is cutaneous lymphoma treatments early and late stage with Dr. Khan. Dr. Khan is an assistant attending physician in the lymphoma service in the Department of Medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. She completed a fellowship in hematology and medical oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where she served as chief fellow. Most of her current research is dedicated to improving cancer care and outcomes for patients with CTCL and quality of life for people with lymphoma and survivors of lymphoma. She is also involved in clinical trials to find new and better ways to treat rare lymphomas, such as Hodgkin lymphoma, cutaneous skin lymphoma, and T-cell lymphoma. Please welcome Dr. Kopp. Hi, uh, good good morning, good afternoon to, to all of you. It's, it's really an, an honor to be able to, to talk with you today. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about um, some general approaches to mycosis fungoides, um, which is the most common you know, subtype of T-cell lymphoma. Um, so, you know, we'll start by kind of going over a few general strategies and a general approach, um, a little bit about how we stage patients, um, and then a bit about treatments um, for both early stage disease and advanced stage disease. One thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, uh, this type of lymphoma is, is really um, can present in many different ways. And so all of our treatments are quite personalized to, to the individual patient and the symptoms they're having and um, where the lymphoma is affecting them. So um, these are sort of general principles, but, but all treatments are really very individualized. Uh, so mycosis fungoides is the most common subtype of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Um, and it's characterized by either sort of flat patches, a uh, little bit thicker plaques, or raised bumps or tumors. Um, less commonly, it can involve areas outside of the skin, like the blood or the lymph nodes. Cesare syndrome is called the leukemic variant, which means that there are uh, lymphoma cells circulating in the blood. Um, so this often um, is, is characterized by um, diffuse redness or erythroderma of the skin um, and can also involve uh, the lymph nodes. Um, there are lots of different options for treatment. Um, so again, it, it, treatment really depends on where the lymphoma is affecting the patient and, and how um, the patients are feeling. Um, lymph, this type of lymphoma is generally treated as a chronic disease. Um, the only sort of curative treatment for um, this lymphoma is something called an allogeneic stem cell transplant, which is where you receive stem cells from another person. Um, so we, we do sometimes consider this for, for certain patients, but um, this procedure ha can have a lot of side effects. And so generally, we try and manage this with the mildest and safest treatments that we can. We try to use the treatments for as long as we can. And we do often recycle treatments. So we may start with one treatment, switch to something else, and then possibly go back to that first treatment. We also try and minimize infections. Uh, infectious complications can be a major um, issue with this type of lymphoma because the skin, um, you know, is is can can allow for some pathogens to get in. Um, so good skin care is really critical. And then lastly, we really try and improve quality of life, minimizing itch, pain, um, and other symptoms that patients may experience. Um, in order to do all of this, we work in a multidisciplinary team. So I'm a medical oncologist uh, at, at MSK, and I work very closely with uh, dermatologists, radiation oncologists, and then of course, our pathologists to help us make diagnoses. Um, so generally, when we see patients who have, um, you know, possible MF, um, you know, this, this part really starts with the dermatology team. Um, so they'll do a skin exam, they'll kind of look and understand the types of, of skin findings that we see, and how much of the skin is involved. Um, patients will then have a biopsy. Um, and if, if the diagnosis um, suggests uh, mycosis fungoides, then um, they'll have some baseline lab work and some uh, imaging scans in certain situations. 
In terms of the biopsies, um, there are two different ways. Sometimes dermatologists will do a, a shave biopsy or they'll do sort of a punch biopsy. Um, when doing a biopsy, it's recommended to do this off any topical steroids. So sometimes um, the dermatologist will ask you to hold your topical steroids for you know a, a week or two um, just to make sure that um, that doesn't affect the diagnosis. Um, it is difficult to diagnose MF. Um, it really sort of takes, um, you know, expert pathology review and, and you know, some suspicion from the, the clinician, um, because as, as you'll see, MF can really kind of mimic some other skin conditions like eczema or psoriasis in the way that it looks. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, unfortunately not uncommon for patients to have, you know, several different biopsies at different time points before we're able to make the diagnosis. Um, when the when the biopsy is is performed, um, things that the pathologists are looking for are how the lymphocytes look in the skin, looking for certain markers that are expressed by the T cells that are causing the lymphoma in the skin, um, and then trying to see if the T cells that are seen in the skin are all the same or if they're different. If they're all the same, um, and the way that we tell that is by looking for um, T cell receptor gene rearrangements. Um, that makes us think more that this is a type of lymphoma. Um, so as you can see, there are, you know, other skin conditions that really, you know, can sort of mimic MF. Um, as, as someone who's not a dermatologist, I think this is really where, you know, we, we so value the, the input from, of our dermatology colleagues to help us kind of differentiate between some of these. Um, but as you can see, there's eczema, psoriasis, and then certain fungal infections. Um, so when we do our skin exams, um, you know, we're looking both for the type of lesion and how much of the skin is involved. Um, this diagram here, um, so the, the palm of your hand is considered to be about half a percent of your total skin surface area. Um, and then your hand is considered to be one percent. So when we're staging patients, um, part of the staging is, is in looking at how much of the skin is involved. Um, so patients that have less than 10% of their skin involved are, are really in the very early stages. Um, then some patients will have a little bit more than 10% of the skin involved. Um, and then patients who have either tumors or, or generalized um, erythroderma or redness of the skin are considered to have more advanced stage disease. Um, so here are a couple of photos of what we might expect to see. Um, so for patients who have the early stage disease where they really kind of have these um, flat patches. Um, and one thing to keep in note is, is that, um, so they may be hyperpigmented in, in um, uh, Caucasian patients. They may be hypopigmented in African-American patients or patients of color. Um, in a little bit, um, these patches can also become a little bit thicker and, and show up as these plaques. Um, and then in more advanced stages, we'll see these raised tumors, generalized erythroderma or redness of the skin. Um, and then um, if, if the lymphoma is, is involving the blood in what we call Cesare syndrome, um, the pathologist will see these Cesare cells under the microscope. Um, staging also involves assessments of other um, areas that may be involved by the lymphoma. Most commonly, the lymphoma does only involve the skin, but um, we also look at whether or not lymph nodes are involved, whether or not organs are involved, whether or not the blood is involved. Um, the overall staging system, you know, kind of looks at all of these different compartments. Um, and, and this is just a diagram showing the different areas where you may have lymph nodes and where we'll, we'll kind of examine to see if any lymph nodes are affected or enlarged. Um, so for any stage, supportive care is really critical. Um, so, um, you know, good skin care can prevent against infections, Good skin care can, um, you know, help uh, reduce um, the symptoms of itching and, and pain that can sometimes happen. Um, so we really recommend um, the use of a good emollient um, to hydrate the skin. Um, sometimes we'll advise um, the use of bleach baths, um, dilute bleach baths um, to help decrease the risk of skin infections. Um, and then we'll, we'll address the use of itch. Um, the best way to really treat itch is by treating the lymphoma, but um, as, as the treatments are kicking in, we can also use things like topical steroids. Um, we can use oral agents, um, things like hydroxyzine. 
um, or things like um, gabapentin, um, and then some other agents can sometimes be used as well. Um, with regard to skin-directed therapies, um, this is what we use for very early stage disease, um, and especially patients who have really kind of limited areas of involvement. Um, so we can kind of think of these in, in different categories. We have, um, you know, topical treatments, things like topical steroids or other creams. Um, phototherapy is something else that we use in, in this stage, and then also radiation therapy. Um, so patients can, can have either a total skin electron beam, which is a low dose of radiation to the whole skin, or some focalized radiation to tumors that are bothersome. Um, we often do kind of recycle treatments or use treatments in combinations. Um, sometimes we use radiation up front to get some initial clearing, um, and then we'll use some other therapies for maintenance. Um, so when patients sort of have, you know, maybe one or, or a couple of solitary, um, you know, patches or plaques, um, these are, this is really a situation when, um, you know, applying a cream can be feasible and helpful. So we have either topical steroids, um, topical nitrogen mustard, or topical vexeratine. Um, so topical corticosteroids are used um, for many inflammatory conditions, including um, this type of lymphoma. Um, we'll often prescribe um, a potent class one topical steroid, so something like uh, clobetasol, um, to use twice a day. And it does have good overall um, response. It may not clear the skin. Um, I think this in this photo here, we really see some nice clearing of the skin. Um, the steroids may not clear the skin entirely. There may be some residual um, hyperpigmentation or darkening of the skin. Um, some of the side effects with using this long term include thinning of the skin, um, hypopigmentation sometimes, and then also something called striae, where you see some, some kind of darkening um, of the skin. Um, there are some um, factors which can influence how effective these topical steroids are. So generally, we prefer a thicker vehicle to apply. Um, the area where we're applying makes a difference. So um, steroids work better where the skin is thinner and it's easier to penetrate. Um, they also work better on the thinner uh, patches when compared to plaques. Um, they do actually penetrate better where areas of skin are very inflamed. Um, and then finally, they do penetrate better when the skin is well hydrated. Um, another medication is something called Valclor or the topical nitrogen mustard. Um, so this was approved, um, you know, for patients who maybe have tried skin-directed treatments like steroids before. Um, and it it's, uh, has a good overall response rate in terms of getting some skin clearing. Uh, it can cause some burning, itching, or irritation um, at the site where it's applied. Uh, ways to minimize this are by, um, you know, using some topical steroids as well, um, or maybe decreasing the frequency of the valve floor. Um, there's some, some data that this may contribute to some increased risk of other skin cancers, um, so something to keep in mind if, if considering this treatment. Uh, Bexeratine um, is also an option. So this is a vitamin, vitamin A derivative or a retinoid cream. Um, it's also approved um, for uh, kind of early stage disease. It does have a good overall response, but can take some time to work like all of our other um, topical treatments um, and can cause some mild to moderate irritation of the application site. Um, Bexeratine in both oral and topical forms can be teratogenic, and so um, it's very important to use contraception um, if you're of uh, childbearing age while, while using these treatments. Um, sometimes uh, the lymphoma will involve some more of the skin, um, more than 10% of the body surface area, and so then it becomes a little more difficult to apply creams to, to all the affected areas. So then we think about introducing something like phototherapy. Um, so phototherapy is thought to induce um, apoptosis or cell death by acting on the surface membrane proteins of cells. Um, it comes in two different formulations, narrow band uh, UVB or something called GUVA. 
Um, it's generally given in dermatologist's office, um, but home light boxes are available. So if, if this is a treatment that's working for you, um, you can look into seeing whether or not you're, you can have a home light box um, done so you don't have to be going to the dermatologist quite so much. Uh, in terms of narrowband UV, uh, UVB, um, this is, uh, again, fairly effective in, in getting um, initial skin clearing. Uh, we typically will start with, with doing this about three times a week. Um, it's a short treatment, um, but, but you would sort of go to your dermatologist's office to get the treatment. Um, it, it does work better on areas where the, the lymphoma is thinner, so it, it responds, it, it works better um, in patch disease versus plaque disease and can work better in, in patients with lighter skin. Um, sometimes after getting some initial cl skin clearing, we'll cut down and go to some maintenance with, with twice a week or once a week sessions, which may reduce relapse rates or times to relapse. Um, patients can experience some burning or, or redness um, and irritation at the sites where the phototherapy is given. In terms of long-term data, there's no increased risk of skin cancers with this treatment. Um, in terms of um, uh, the other types of uh, phototherapy, it's something called PUBA, which um, is given um, its UVA radiation and given in association with oral uh, sorolin. Um, so this is thought to uh, penetrate a bit deeper than UVB, but there can be some increased side effects. Um, so uh, it can be associated with some nausea, some increased photosensitivity, um, and then in the long term, um, some possible increased risk of cataracts, photo aging, and then risk of non-melanoma skin cancers. Radiation therapy can also be used in combination um, with some of our other treatments. So um, if, if patients will have sort of a, one or, or two tumors that are very bothersome, they can receive focal radiation to those sites. Um, or if there's um, a lymphoma involving a large area of the skin, uh, sometimes these patients will benefit from something called total skin electron beam therapy or TSCB. Um, so TFCB um, is um, the delivery of a low dose of radiation to the entire uh, skin area. Um, and it's thought to produce rapid skin clearing and symptomatic benefit for patients who do have diffuse involvement of the skin and patients who have thicker um, areas of involvement. So plaques or tumors, which may not respond as well um, just to the phototherapy. Um, it is marked by high response rates um, but uh, the amount of TSCB that can be given is limited by skin toxicity. So things like redness, irritation, or alopecia. Um, and uh, the response uh, duration can also be limited. Um, so typically TSCB can be used um, to get some initial clearing uh, and then allow for maintenance um, uh, to, to kind of keep up the response in the skin. Uh, so again, just to summarize, the goals of the skin-directed treatment, um, really, th they can be used alone, um, and they can also be used in combination, um, either with each other or with systemic treatments um, when patients have more advanced age disease. Uh, the goal is to control the lymphoma. Um, unfortunately, we, we may not be able to completely cure it or completely um, have the, the affected patches go away. But our goal is to improve quality of life, um, prevent the spread of the lymphoma, um, and really um, kind of treat the most bothersome spots and, and control the, the illness. Um, there are a wide variety of systemic treatments that can be used, again, still in combination with, with the previous skin-directed treatments and with good skin care. Um, when choosing these treatments, again, we're choosing the least toxic therapy possible, so with the fewest side effects, to control the disease and the symptoms. Um, what I've copied here is um, a, a listing of some tumor or some treatment options for more advanced stage disease. This comes from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, um, kind of our guidelines for treating these lymphomas. 
So as you can see, there are a wide variety of options. Um, and so it's, it's really about kind of choosing what's best for the specific patients, um, you know, taking into account what their lymphoma is doing, how the patient's feeling, and any other medical um, conditions the patient may have. Um, so I'm going to just uh, kind of touch on a couple of these treatments, but again, the list is, is very extensive. Um, so one uh, treatment that's um, you know commonly used um, when when going to systemic uh, therapy is something called vixerotene or targretin. Um, so this is an oral third generation retinoid that's selectively binds to a retinoid receptor, which inf uh, influences transcription in the cells, um, and it's thought to prevent the cells from growing and and um, you know cause them to die off more quickly. Uh, it's generally well tolerated. Some of the side effects that patients may experience are, are feeling tired. Uh, one notable side effect that we, we see is that patients may have elevated uh, triglycerides or elevated cholesterol, and patients may also have central hypothyroidism. These are both uh, effects that are directly associated to the drug. When the drug is stopped, then these effects should resolve. But when patients are on these treatments, we will often prescribe uh, lipid medications or cholesterol medications and uh, a thyroid supplement, something like uh, Synthroid, um, to, to help control these side effects for patients. And patients will also often get um, you know, close monitoring of their labs until we find good doses of the Vexerotene and of these supportive medications. It does have a good response rate. Um, the response rates for most of our, our treatments are around 40 to 50%, but it can take some time um, to see that response. So, um, you know, between kind of two to three months up to six months to really get a full response. And then of course the side effects, um, namely the, the cholesterol and the thyroid medicines um, can limit our ability to increase the dose of bixerotene um, to maximize the response in the skin. Another medication that we use um, in, in more advanced stage lymphomas is something called romadepsin. So this is an IV treatment. It's a histone deacetylase inhibitor. Um, it has an overall response rate in some of the trials we've done of about 34%, but it does seem to be particularly more effective in the skin um, and in patients who have erythroderma, which is associated with Cesare syndrome. Um, so it, it's a good medication to use in, in those situations. It does have a fairly um, rapid time to, to achieving some response, about two months, and median duration of response lasts for about a year. Um, again, when I say median, I mean that this is kind of the average. So some people you know, responded more quickly and some people did have a longer response. One notable fact about romadepsin is that um, regardless of, of the clinical objective response, so regardless of how we sort of measure disease by looking at the skin or, or measuring it in the blood, um, patients did seem to feel better and, and have a reduction in, in how much itchiness they were experiencing. One of the side effects here um, is that the medication can affect the heart um, and the, the heart rhythm, um, causing something called QT prolongation. So when patients are on this treatment, we monitor um, their electrolytes. So we'll monitor potassium and magnesium. Um, we'll monitor um, electrocardiograms or EKGs, and we'll um, keep an eye on other medications that patients are taking, which may also affect uh, the QT interval. One of the newer agents that we've been using is something called brentuximab vidotin. Um, so this is a medication that's been studied um, in various lymphomas, including Hodgkin lymphoma and other systemic T-cell lymphomas. And it's an antibody drug conjugate, which means that it, um, it targets the CD30 antibody, which is expressed by the lymphoma cells, and delivers a drug kind of more directly to these cells. So it was studied in something called the phase three Alcanza trial. This was a randomized trial in which patients were randomized to either getting this, um, the brentuximab vidotin versus physician's choice of some other more common treatments like methotrexate or bexerotene. 
And it did, um, and when analyzing the trial, we did see that there was a statistically significant improvement in rates of durable response, so response lasting at least four months, when compared to the physician's choice treatments with the methotrexate or vexeratine. One major side effect noted with this medication was neuropathy or numbness, tingling, or pain in the skin or in the, in the fingers and toes. Um, so this typically arose at around um, nine cycles of treatment. Um, for um, This was a reversible side effect. So once the treatment was stopped, it did seem to, to go away in the vast majority of patients. Uh, Mogamolizumab um, is another newer treatment that we've been using. And so this is a antibody to the CCR4 receptor. Um, this was studied again in a randomized trial called the Maverick study. Um, and in this study, patients who either had mycosis fungoides or Cesare syndrome were randomized to mogamolizumab or berinostat, which is another um, kind of uh, FDA approved medication for this, um, this disease. And patients who are treated with mogamolizumab seem to have a better overall response rate um, and um, better time before progression. Uh, common um, adverse events seen with this um, medication, um, patients may have a reaction during the infusion. And so we'll, we'll often give pre-medications with things like Tylenol and Benadryl. Um, some patients may have a rash um, with the mogamolizumab. And so um, again, we, we work closely with our dermatologist to assess the skin when, when patients um, you know, have this drug um, to, to determine if, if patients are having a rash or a reaction to the mogamolizumab versus progression of their disease. Um, diarrhea is also a side effect that was noted in, in the trials. Um, and again, that's something that we can control with, with use of Imodium or other agents. Um, we always um, like to consider clinical trials um, when for a rare disease such as mycosis fungoides. And so, you know, when available, we, we always try to discuss that option with our patients. Um, one um, agent that's um, kind of been being studied now is, is pembrolizumab. So pembrolizumab is a type of immunotherapy. Um, and in a phase two study, um, this was um, explored in about 24 patients who had MF or, or Cesare syndrome. Um, and it did have um, an overall response rate of about 38%, so comparable to some of our other um, FDA-approved therapies. Um, in patients who had Cesare syndrome, there did seem to be a skin flare reaction. Um, and this flare reaction was, was more notable in, in patients who had a high expression of PD-1 on their Cesare cells. So PD-1 is involved in the function of the pembrolizumab. And again, similarly to mogamolizumab, um, we want to distinguish the skin um, flare reaction from progression of disease. Uh, so this is an, a medication that's that's being studied more in, in clinical trials, and there are you know several others. Um, so depending on on you know where you're located and and you know where you're being treated, um, there there can be a variety of different clinical trials available to consider. Um, so just some overall kind of take home points. Um, we really, when managing this type of lymphoma, our goal is to manage this as a chronic condition. So um, really use the mildest and safest treatments that we can over time. Um, and um, using skin directive therapies, supportive care to help us improve quality of life. Um, one thing to keep in mind is again, we try and use the mildest and safest treatments we can. Um, we, we don't we, we do have data that tells us that using kind of more aggressive combination chemotherapies may not be as effective in this type of lymphoma. And so this is why we really try and use these single agents um, in combination with skin-directive treatments. Um, we do encourage participation in clinical trials when available. Um, and the field as a whole, um, you know, really is trying to understand this type of lymphoma more. So um, some of these trials are looking more at, at biomarkers and, and trying to understand precision medicine um, when we're developing our, our best treatment plans for our patients. Um, so I think that's all. So I'm happy to take any questions now. Yes, thank you so much. That was a, a wealth of information that I hope is helpful. Before we start with the questions, I, I do want to preface, we're going to try and answer all that we can. 
Uh, some of the questions that are coming through are, are very specific to a person's diagnosis. And if I do ask your questions, Dr. Khan will have to answer them in a more general uh, knowledge because without actually treating you and seeing your files, uh, she, she's not giving you actual medical advice. She can tell you what she's seen or what is what is out there. So just please keep that in mind. And if I don't ask your question, we are actually going to try and attempt to answer all of them after the conference, or at least direct you into the area where you can find that information. So our first question is about vexeratine. So you had mentioned that and uh, the risk of cholesterol. Could you expound on that a little bit? Does it make people susceptible to high cholesterol? What if they already have naturally high cholesterol? Would another treatment be recommended? Absolutely. So, um, you know, it, it does um, tend to raise the cholesterol levels um, and specifically it will raise the level of triglycerides. So it is an expected side effect. And I would say that most of our patients, even those who have normal cholesterol or triglyceride levels before starting, um, will require some type of uh, cholesterol medication. Um, it, it is a reversible side effect. So, you know, once it's stopped, then um, we do expect the levels to get back down to normal and we would be able to stop the additional cholesterol medications at that point. Um, we do use vexeratine in people who do have high cholesterol levels, um, but we, we just monitor this very closely. Um, again, I think this, this would sort of be a discussion for you with your doctor, but it also depends a little bit on your individual risks and um, you know, risks for you that could be associated with particularly high um, cholesterol levels. Um, you know, vexeratine, if, if there's a, a specific reason why, um, you know, tight um, cholesterol level is really essential, then vexeratine may not be the best treatment. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that we do think that this is a, a dose dependent effect. So, um, you know, you might start with, with a very low dose of vexeratine to see if you, that will control your lymphoma and, and also allow for your cholesterol to be controlled. Um, there are other formulations of retinoic acid that are available as well. And so, um, you know, those, those may, um, can, can also be tried. Um, those may have a little bit of uh, less effect on the cholesterol. Okay, thank you for that information. Uh, so the question next is they actually are looking for uh, more of an explanation on why clinical, clinical trials are encouraged. Absolutely. Um, so I think when we do our clinical trials, um, we do them with the goal of trying to identify a better treatment um, than what's currently available. Um, and I, I think that our hope for really a lot of our, you know, all of our patients is that we, we try and get them the best treatment possible. So the clinical trial is thought to be a way um, to kind of um, get patients access to a more novel uh, therapy um, before it's, it's sort of widely av available elsewhere. Um, the other reason that we, we do kind of recommend clinical trials for patients who have rare diseases or rare lymphomas is that, um, you know, it is a way to kind of access these, these treatments um, as, as they're being studied in, in more rare populations. Um, so, you know, these are some of the reasons that we do encourage consideration of clinical trials. Um, of course, you know, a clinical trial may not be the best decision for everyone, but um, it is a it is a po possible opportunity to get a newer treatment um, more quickly. Thank you. And without clinical trials, we wouldn't have new drugs. And in, in, in this disease, finding things that work for people is always very important. So our next question is, have you ever seen a patient with oral MF? And if so, how did you treat them? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it, it's, it's more rare to have oral MF. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, I, I guess I, I sort of haven't personally seen a patient who has had oral MF. Um, you know, I, I think that um, some of my colleagues um, there was one patient who, who did have sort of a, a tumor lesion that was involving the mouth. And I think that that patient um, had some radiation to that specific site. Um, I think that if you have um, MF that's kind of, um, you know, perioral, um, you can certainly use topical steroids to that area. Um, but, but I haven't sort of personally treated a patient who's had oral MF. Okay, thank you. 
So this next question, I'm, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit so that it, it's something that, that will be easier for you to answer is uh, what's happening with this patient is they've had biopsies and uh, they're being told that they're not 100% sure if it's MS or I'm sorry, MF or a drug eruption. Mm -hmm. So how, how would you go about making that determination? Yeah. No, I, I, I think, you know, unfortunately, what you're describing is, is not uncommon. And, and we do, you know, frequently get patients where there's, you know, a, a suspicion of MF, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's not entirely clear. Um, and, you know, one of the difficult things about this diagnosis is it really um, isn't something that we can do completely with, with pathology. And so, you know, the biopsy results may not tell us 100%. Um, so some things that can help us, um, you know, in, in deciding which one it is. Um, so a clinical history, seeing if there is, you know, a new medication that's been started or any medications that you're on, um, you know, trying to hold those medications or change those medications, see if there's any improvement in the skin. Um, looking for clonality can also help us. Um, so trying to see if the, the T cells that are involved in the um, in the biopsy specimen are all the same or if they're different. Um, if they're all the same, that might point more towards um, a diagnosis of MF. Um, and um, some, some other, you know, things that can sometimes help us. Um, we do sometimes do uh, genomic profiling, which is where we look for specific mutations um, within these cells. Um, there are some mutations that we do see more commonly in MF, and so that might help us think a little bit more that this is, um, this is MF rather than a drug eruption. Um, but unfortunately, it, it is a tough diagnosis to make, and, and sometimes it does take time and, and different biopsies to, to really clear it up. Um, and, and understand how the skin is behaving. I think that's uh, one of the challenges with this disease is getting the right diagnosis. And so anything that, uh, that can be done to help that is great. So our next question is, uh, how would you go about determining who you would recommend for bleach fast? And would you recommend bleach fast? Yeah, um, so that's a very good question. Um, so I, I guess I, I have to put in a little disclaimer in that I'm an oncologist and, and not a dermatologist. And so frequently the dermatologists um, are the ones who are recommending the bleach baths. Um, I think that we, but but generally I think that the bleach baths are recommended when, when patients are more at risk for infection. So um, when patients kind of have um, more widespread areas of disease or, or disease that um, you know, seems to be a little bit thicker and more involved. Okay, thank you. And uh, when we do our clinical Q&A panel, we will have a dermatologist and our a hematologist oncologist. So you can always ask that question again then. So this next question uh, ties in a little bit more with your quality of life work is can MF cause fatigue and malaise? Yes, I think, um, you know, unfortunately, I, I, I do think that it can. Um, and I, I think it can do this in, in a couple of different ways. I think that, um, you know, one of the, the things that we, we find is that patients can, can really be profoundly affected by the itch that's involved in MF. And I think that one of the ways that the itch manifests is, is in, you know, affecting sleep. And, and it's, it's unfortunately, um, we do see that patients are, are fatigued just because they're not getting good sleep. Um, I think that, um, you know, the, the MF can also, um, you know, affect how, how we're kind of experiencing and, and interacting with our colleagues and our, our, our friends and family and sometimes, and so, um, you know, that can also, um, you know, kind of more indirectly cause, cause some fatigue and cause some malaise. Um, but, but yes, I think absolutely that's something that, that can be caused with the MF. Thank you. So the next one uh, is a specific question about a drug that I am going to butcher the pronunciation. I will give it a shot. And is have you used, I think it's acitretin, A-C-I-T-R-E-T-I-N? And if so, what are the side effects and warnings on this drug? Yeah, so so this is um, another um, kind of oral retinoid, and and so it's um, you know it's associated. It's similar to the bexerotine. Um, it does seem to have um, you know possibly fewer um, uh, fewer effects in terms of the cholesterol. Um, it, I think that it, it's it's typically used for other dermatologic conditions, um, and so so we we 
I think vexerotine has kind of been specifically studied in MF, but um, you know, I think this medication is an option. Um, so the the warnings here are really similar to to other um, you know vitamin A derivatives um, in that it, it can be teratogenic, and so um, you know again we. I think one of the major warnings that we think about with this medication is is making sure that that people are using proper birth control and, and contraception, um, and um, you know not um, you know avoiding conceiving. Okay, thank you. Uh, on this next one, uh, we're talking about disease progression, and uh, the patient is asking. My understanding is that treatment does not prevent progression. So if there's no itching connected with MF stage 1A, is there any reason to do any treatment? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, again, I, I'd want you to sort of discuss with your doctor, but, um, you know, the, the goals of treatment are really to kind of control things and um, to improve quality of life. And so I think if, if you do have kind of this early stage disease and you do have a few patches and um, it's, it's, you know, not causing a lot of itching or causing other symptoms for you, um, then, you know, I, I think it's reasonable, you know, not, not to treat it. Um, you know, I, I do think that sometimes when when you have some MF, if if you you know have patches, it, it can grow. So, um, you know, it, you you may not need to treat it every day, but you may need to spot treat it intermittently. Okay, so um, so quality of life, as we know, is important. So not having itch is great, but need to need to still keep an eye on it. All right, uh, another question we have, right, kind of along this is. Will my skin ever clear up? I know it's a tough one, but yeah. that, that's a question we get a lot is, is it ever going to stop? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, so, you know, I, I think our, and, and again, everybody is a little bit different. I, I do think it's reasonable to expect, um, you know, the itching to, to go down and to be controlled. Um, you know, we do see that, uh, you know, sometimes after applying topical steroids um, or using phototherapy or, or um, the TSCB or other kind of skin treatments, we do see that the skin will clear. Um, it, it may not clear completely. There may still be some kind of residual spots that, that need, um, you know, some kind of ongoing treatment. Um, and, and one other thing that, that we can see is that um, even after the active lymphoma has cleared, so after it's kind of no longer red or itchy, um, you can have some, some leftover changes in the skin. So the skin, um, you know, where the lymphoma had been, um, you know, may be hyperpigmented um, and it may, may not look completely like it did before. Um, but we, we do hope that, um, you know, we can clear up the, the part that's very itching, that's kind of red and, and angry. All right, that's great, the great information. So on this one, uh, it, it might've been missed. Uh, you might've already addressed this, uh, but if so, it, it didn't quite kick in. But have um, prolexitrate, um, do you use it as an intravenous treatment? And what were your thoughts on, the success, success rate and is it consider, considered chemotherapy? Absolutely. Um, so, um, you know, pralotrexate is an IV therapy. Um, so it is certainly something, um, you know, that, that can be used here. Um, I think it's, it's also been used for, um, you know, uh, peripheral T cell lymphomas. Um, it's so, um, you know, it's, it's an IV therapy. Um, it's a, it's a folate analog. Um, so it's, it's similar to another kind of oral medication called methotrexate. Um, some of the main side effects here are, um, uh, uh, changes in your blood counts. Um, so you can have lowering of your white blood counts, your red blood counts, um, and your platelets. Um, you can also have some mouth sores, um, and it can also affect um, some of your lab tests, like your liver function tests. Um, you know, it, it can be effective. I, I would consider this a, a type of um, chemotherapy. I would consider it a type of single agent chemotherapy. Um, it, it can be effective. I don't, I don't think it's the most effective, um, you know, in, in this um, lymphoma, but, um, you know, it, it can be something that, that's used. Thank you. 
So next we have, uh, in your opinion, when should an oncologist be brought in as part of the medical team? That's a great question. I mean, um, you know, I think every kind of center and, and institution is different. Um, I, where where I practice, we we do tend to see our patients together. So so the oncologist will see a lot of patients with the dermatologists. Um, you know, kind of early in the in the disease course. Um, I think that that you know one time when you know the oncologist can certainly be brought in as if if we're considering some of these um, more systemic treatments. So um, you know once you start to get into to the pills or the IV treatments, it can be helpful to have the input from the oncologist. Um, although every center is a little bit different, I think at at other centers, you know, dermatologists um, you know will give the bexarotene, um, and I think sometimes they will give chemotherapy. Um, I, I think it's always, you know, nice to, to have input from, from both, um, you know, an oncologist and a dermatologist. So, I, you know, I think if possible, um, you know, it, it's reasonable at least to get an initial opinion from the oncologist and then patients can follow, you know, more closely with their dermatologist. There's always benefits to having that multidisciplinary team helping you out. So our next question is a little bit of a two-parter and it's one of those ones that uh, some of the questions are very specific to, to their treatment. So again, Dr. Khan can, can give you some generalizations, but uh, don't take this as a second opinion. So they are on bexarotene and are asking how long should I be on these and what can happen to my liver? That it has helped a lot, but I still have its and spots of a rash that bleed at times. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a good question. Again, I, I, I sort of can't give you, um, you know, specific answers about it, but, um, you know, we, we do use um, bexarotene for extended periods of time. So um, again, I, I think it would kind of depend on exactly what was happening with your liver and, and um, you know, if, if it was responding. Um, one thing you can do is you can, um, you know, try going down on the dose and seeing if that helps. Um, you know, bexarotene um, is, I think, an effective medication, but it may not completely clear the skin. And so, um, you know, sometimes um, we all consider adding something else to the bexarotene. So, um, you know, using topical steroids for those spot areas that are, um, you know, causing problems. Um, and if, if there are any kind of large raised areas like tumors, um, you know, considering some radiation just to those spots. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're kind of moving away a little bit from treatment questions and some general questions. So if, if there's anything that I'm asking that, that really can't be answered, please, please let me know. Does having cutaneous lymphoma put you at risk for other cancers? Um, so we have seen that there can be an association between cutaneous lymphoma um, and um, some other, um, you know, skin cancers. We don't think that it, it may increase your risk for other kind of solid organ cancers, um, but, um, you know, we, we do sometimes see that there are other skin conditions um, in, in patients who have um, mycosis fungoides. Great, thank you. Uh, are you aware of any triggers that cause flare-ups that, that have been identified so that we can try and avoid some of those triggers? Yeah, um, you know, I think um, in, in terms of, of understanding what, so I, I guess, um, you know, one question is what causes it in general, and I think um, we don't kind of know exactly what causes it. I think there's some thoughts that, um, you know, exposure to, to different chemicals can be associated with it. Um, you know, there's some thought that um, associations with um, immunosuppression for long periods of time um, can be associated with it. Um, and then in, in terms of kind of day-to-day -day triggers after it happens, um, so, so mycosis fungoides is, is interesting in that, you know, we think about other skin cancers being triggered by sunlight and, and MF is, is really not thought to be triggered by sun, skin, but excuse me, by sunlight. Um, we actually anecdotally have seen that um, in summertime, um, the skin tends to get better. Um, and we see that the MF can sometimes be worse in, in areas that don't typically see skin. Um, so we don't think of that as, as a specific 
um, you know, trigger or um, something that will make it worse. Uh, I don't think that there are really specific things that that we, um, you know, think of making this worse. Um, sometimes patients will tell us though that, you know, they find that when they're stressed, um, that their their MF seems to flare a little bit more. And so, um, you know, that, that may be something, but um, I don't think there's a specific um, thing that we would say that you should do or, or shouldn't do. Okay, thank you. And that actually kind of just ties into the question that just popped up is how does stress impact MF and CTCL? Yeah, um, so so I don't think that we we kind of have formal data um, saying that that stress will you know either worsen or or cause um, the development of CTCL, um, but you know we do um, sort of hear that patients will feel that that their their MF is is flaring when they're under under stress. So, um, you know, we, we don't kind of have formal data about that, but um, I think, you know, for general health, we always recommend trying to, to you know, minimize stress. And, and so, um, you know, that, that may play a role. We could all live stress-free and be wonderful. Okay, so I want to let them know we're, we're down to a little under 10 minutes. So if you want to get your questions in, please get them in there. We'll try and uh, get through all the ones that we still have out there. So uh, we have a patient who's currently using Valclor and they're having some difficulty reaching their back. Do you, what would, do you have any recommendations that you give patients to, to be able to get to those out of the way, out of the easy reach areas? Yeah, um, no, that's a, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, sometimes I, I don't sort of have a specific um, device that I would suggest. I know some some patients have said that they've they've kind of gone on Amazon and they've they've actually found um, uh, kind of um, like a, a back scratcher that has been helpful to them to help reach those hard to hard to get to areas. Um, you know, so so that's. Um, one thing that I think patients have found to be helpful, um, you know, you, we could also you could also consider kind of depending on on you know where the lymphoma is overall, um, maybe using something um, like phototherapy if it is really difficult to reach the the affected areas of, of lymphoma. Um, you know, add, adding something kind of for a short term might help clear up those areas that are difficult to reach. Okay, thank you. Uh, so a couple of questions have come in regarding diet. So I'm going to combine the two of them for you. Uh, so the, the first is, are there dietary interventions that can help with cutaneous lymphoma? I've heard that sugar can encourage cancer cell growth. And one of the other questions was, would cutting meat and animal products out help? Yeah, those are those are great questions. Um, so so there is no um, you know kind of diet plan or program that we recommend. Um, and I, I don't think that we have really conclusive data suggesting that, you know, any specific diet would be um, better than another um, for, for MF. Um, again, we, we recommend, um, you know, since we are kind of managing this as a chronic disease and our, our hope is really to, to control this over, you know, your, your very long lifespan, um, we, we do want you to do everything possible to kind of maintain a healthy diet. So, um, and what I mean by that is, is a diet in moderation. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't sort of advise anybody to really cut out, um, you know, meat or, or integral products or, or sugar altogether. Um, I think that, you know, what, what you kind of mentioned about sugar causing cancer cells to grow, um, you know, I think all cells actually require sugar to, to grow and to function. And so, um, you know, I think that, that, you know, any healthy cell in your body does require sugars, and and we don't have data saying that, um, you know, avoiding meat or avoiding sugar, um, you know, will will help the the cancer or keep it from growing. Um, but just by by way of um, kind of generally maintaining your health, um, you know, we would recommend kind of a moderate diet with with plenty of fruits and vegetables, and um, you know, not not excessively kind of taking in sugar, but. But I think, you know, certainly if it's, if it's a birthday and you want to have some cake, you should, you should have some cake. <laughs> Everybody loves cake. But uh, I, I remember when I realized, you know, my doctor's right, eating healthy and, and getting regular exercise. That's the, that's the way to, that's the way to do it. Uh, so before I answer, ask this next question, uh, which is one that we get quite a bit in, in it's people trying to explain what is cutaneous lymphoma to their friends and loved ones. 
Um, we recently did a series of videos that are out on our uh, foundation YouTube channel and some of the other questions I'm seeing in here, we have some videos on, but we did some, some little videos where it said, is this cancer? Is it blood cancer? And we had a few docs answer that. Uh, but um, for the sake of this group, uh, so, so is this skin cancer? Is this blood cancer? I'm trying to explain it to my friends and family and I'm struggling. And this is something that newly diagnosed patients always struggle with. So it's always good to hear what is it? Yeah, um, no, that's a great question. So, um, you know, the way that we, um, so, so mycosis fungoides is a type of lymphoma and lymphoma is a type of cancer of the white blood cells. Um, so, so, you know, these are cells that are, that are in your blood. Um, and we have these lymphocytes uh, all through our body. So we do have lymphocytes in our blood, but we also have lymphocytes in our lymph nodes, and we also have lymphocytes that are in our skin. And so these lymphocytes that are in the skin are what is causing the lymphoma or the cancer. Um, so it's, it's sort of not what you would think of when you typically think of skin cancer. Um, so when you think, typically think of skin cancer, um, you know, you think of a, of a type of cell that, that otherwise, um, you know, lives only in the skin. So things like basal cell cancers or melanomas. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, that MF, um, you know, you, you can't sort of think of it as a type of skin cancer, but it, but it's involving cells that live in, in the blood. Thank you. That was a, that was a very good answer and easy to understand. So our next question, and I think we're going to have one more after this, and then we're going to be out of time, is can B cell become or develop into T cell? Um, yeah, so, so, so no, they cannot. Um, so, so B cells and T cells are both um, type of lymphocytes. So these are both types of, of white blood cells. Um, mycosis fungoides is caused by the T cell specifically. Um, there are other cancers and other lymphomas that can be caused by B cells, and, and some of these can involve the skin, um, but we, we wouldn't expect to see B cells becoming T cells. Okay, great. Uh, here's our last question, and I think you kind of touched on it a little bit, but uh, can CTCL spread and affect organs? Um, so it, it is rare to have the CTCL spread. Um, most patients with, with CTCL are diagnosed at early stages. And, and for most patients who are diagnosed at an early stage, it stays at an early stage. Um, you know, we would not expect it to, to spread to other um, to other areas um, within the skin um, unless we saw a, a rapid change in the skin itself. Um, so it, it can affect, um, you know, lymph nodes or, or, or organs, but that is, that is very rare. Um, I think for, for most people, it really stays in the skin. And if it were to spread beyond the skin, um, we would expect to see, you know, a, a lot of growth within the skin before we started to see it affecting the organs. Okay. And uh, we got one more question that slipped it under the wire along that same path is, what other cancers could develop from B cell? From from B cell sensor? Yes. Oh, okay. From um, B cell. What other cancers could develop from B cell, and can they? From B cells. So, um, you know, B cells um, can also cause lymphomas. Um, so, um, lymphomas can um, involve just the skin. So, other cutaneous lymphomas. Um, there are things like cutaneous follicle center lymphoma or cutaneous marginal zone lymphoma. Um, so, these are other um, kind of lymphomas that involve the skin, but they're caused by B cells, not T cells. Um, uh, B cell lymphoma can also involve the body. So um, you can have other kinds of what we call systemic B cell lymphomas that involve, um, you know, other areas in the body like lymph nodes and, and the blood. Hey, thank you. So that is going to be our last question. And I want to say thank you, Dr. Khan, for taking the time with your presentation and answering all these wonderful questions. Uh, so we're going to be taking a lunch break next, and I hope uh, you will all be joining us for our networking sessions after. And as a reminder, these sessions are exclusively for patients and their loved ones in order to provide privacy and encourage open communication with each other. So enjoy your break, and we hope to see you after. Thank you.